takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podium anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Colleen Kennedy, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Club Toronto. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated systemic issues that have plagued long-term care facilities for decades. With newfound urgency and the attention of the public, media, and government, now is the time to take the necessary actions to improve care and quality of life for our most vulnerable seniors. We are honored to host a panel of experts today for a frank and solutions-oriented discussion as we look to the future of long-term care in Ontario and Canada. Before we dive into today's topics, here's some information on how to best participate in today's event. The click here to switch stream button will help if you're having internet issues. The video will be shaky, but the audio will remain strong. And if you click on the questions tab, you can enter your questions in the window and they will be sent to our wonderful moderator, Laura Stone today. So please send them in early and we will try to get to as many as we can. As a nonprofit organization with standing operating costs, our 2021 season and virtual events look a little bit different. Some paid, some free, and next week we will be launching our new membership plan so please join us to access more thought leadership and important discussions about our great country. We appreciate support and understanding during these times. Now, I would like to thank today's event sponsor, Torkin Mains. The Canadian Club, as I mentioned, is a nonprofit and we have been gathering people together for 124 years. It is because of our sponsors that we can continue to do that. We are grateful for your sport, support today, Torkin Mains. And speaking about our 124 great years that have seen everyone from Amelia Earhart to Margaret Thatcher take our stage, I want to acknowledge the recent passing of our honorary lifetime director, the Right Honorable John Napier Turner. We are lucky to have counted on his gracious support over the years. He took to our podium many times, sharing his wonderful stories and passion for a free and democratic nation. We mourn his loss and wish his family our great condolences. And now, today's panelists. Donna Duncan is the CEO of the Ontario Long-Term Care Association. Wendy Beckles is the president and CEO of, the she of Shepherd Villages, Inc and Laura Tamblin Watts is the president and CEO of CanAge. And finally, Katie Smith Sloan is president and CEO of Leading Age. Today's panel will be moderated by Laura Stone, reporter for the Globe and Mail. One of the club's traditions that has not changed in this virtual world is to toast the country usually done in person with the raising of a glass. Let's make a nod towards the screen and toast Canada. To Canada! And Laura, now I'll turn the Canadian podium over to you. Thank you so much and thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I think I speak for everyone when who's on this call when I say I'm very much looking forward to 
hearing from our panelists about this incredibly important issue. I don't think there was any issue that came to the forefront more during COVID-19 than long-term care. And whether we had a family member in long-term care, whether we knew someone who was there, or whether it just appealed to our humanity. I think some of the stories that we heard about and the conditions that these uh, seniors were going through and experienced and died in during the pandemic were incredibly heart-wrenching and disturbing to say the least. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, hearing from our panel on ways to improve and move forward in long-term care. So I'd like to start the discussion off just by looking at what the system looked like heading into the pandemic, and then we'll talk about the situation on the ground. But I'd like to start with you, uh, Donna. Maybe you can just set us up as to what were some of the, the issues that long-term care was facing before the pandemic, and then how did those issues get exacerbated as we saw COVID-19 enter long-term care homes? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Lauren. Thank you, everyone. It's it's I'm privileged to to be amongst such uh, esteemed uh, experts. You know, certainly in Ontario, we were quite explicit uh, going into our pre-budget consultations in Ontario that we were facing a perfect storm, and at that time we didn't we didn't contemplate what the pandemic was going to look like. We knew that uh, regardless, uh, we were set up for failure. Uh, we had a critical staffing shortage that was only getting worse, enormous stigma about working in the sector. Uh, certainly we had old buildings uh, built to 1970 standards with three and four bedrooms. So that outdated infrastructure that was actually not built for the population of residents that we have. Uh, there wasn't a recognition of what long-term care is today and who is in long-term care. Our residents are very, very frail. They have multiple medical conditions. They're much older uh, and highly, highly vulnerable. Uh, in addition, uh, we we'd had various funding cuts over, over the past year that uh, further uh, promised to destabilize us. So it, it, you know, as we certainly watched what was happening in Europe and Italy and Spain in particular, uh, at the end of January, we were very, very busy working with government about how we were going to decant hospitals. And, and there was this very, very focused uh, activity around uh, building capacity in hospitals, anticipating uh, a hospital surge. The ventilators was a big topic, but n we, no one was talking about long-term care. And, but we could see what was happening, uh, and we were, we, were, we were very concerned. And then as, as this hit when we had our first cases, uh, fear. The element of fear just overtook everyone and what was a critical staffing issue became worsened. So when there was a first case in a home, in many cases, staff left, they fled uh, out of fear, largely. Uh, you know, and, and luckily, in, in most cases, the majority of homes didn't end up having outbreaks, but uh, there were some homes that were critically incapacitated and, and that's where we saw the most um, tragic losses of life uh, and that staffing piece was critical. The, the property, the, the physical plant, those rooms uh, were certainly created real barriers and we didn't know about this disease. We didn't know about asymptomatic spread. Uh, and then the other piece on this is there was a, a worldwide shortage of uh, personal protective equipment uh, and we didn't appreciate that we needed to do the kind of masking. We didn't appreciate that our uh, infection prevention and control protocols that we used in flu outbreaks were never going to match this. So uh, certainly as we saw staff leave uh, and uh, because we were isolated from the rest of the healthcare system, it was really challenging for us to get help. Uh, and unfortunately, um, that isolation, those conditions uh, really, uh, really fed into the, the, that tragic loss of life. And uh, uh, we, we've certainly learned from that. Laura, I'd like to go to you next. Why do you think, as Donna uh, speaks about the warnings that were issued to long-term care, why do you think that some or at least a good portion of these homes did not seem ready to handle the pandemic? And what did the situation look like on the ground? It was awful. And there are no real bad guys here. And I think that that's important to say because you know, when we have a terrible, terrible circumstance, we're always looking for a bad guy. You know, we have a circumstance where our long-term care homes, as Donna said, you know, we're in crisis 
before that. They were in crisis because of funding shortages. They were in fund crisis because of infrastructure, renewal challenges. They we don't have a health and human resources. And we were kind of in crisis because every single government was doing this, right? It was always somebody else's fault. And we've heard that narrative time and time again, that this crisis is not our fault in long-term care. It's from previous governments. But you know, we've heard that every single time that there's a government. And I guess, so that piece is real. There was an evolving sense of understanding, however, in some other jurisdictions. So CanAge, my national seniors advocacy organization is pan-Canadian. So we were focusing across this country. And what I have to say is, you know, quite frankly, the response time from the Ontario and Quebec governments was very delayed. And indeed, some of the initial aspects that were put into place by Premier Hogan and uh, Bonnie Henry in British Columbia did not get implemented in Ontario until April the 22nd, and even then not in an easy way. And so I think that, you know, the first piece is the system was underfunded, in crisis, short-staffed prior. We didn't know enough about it, but the delay was profound. And you will see that the loss of life, if you compare Ontario, for instance, to to BC, and it's not the only aspect, but but it is significant to say it's about tenfold for what we had in British Columbia. And that timeline does this in terms of exacerbation. So it plays a, that response time, it plays a key role. And maybe I'll just finish by giving you one snapshot of what it was like on the ground. I mean, we got emails, phone calls, every kind of reach out that we could possibly have to our teams with people weeping on the other end, saying that they can't see people, that they don't know what's happening, that there's not information. And some of those people were providers of long-term care who were also in crisis. So this is not kind of a one, one bad guy scenario, but the piece that spoke to me and, and Donna, you and I know we were having this conversation together where we were rallying nail salons and hairdressers in local communities to donate their gloves and masks because the government would not give them to long-term care. They were stockpiling them in the acute care setting. And those of us in the field were saying, we know what's coming. We saw it in Asia, we saw it in Europe. We knew it was coming and we knew it would hit our frailest frail in congregate settings. And we knew that long-term care wouldn't be prepared. And they refused time and time again to give the personal protective equipment. So who are the heroes? In some cases, we're talking about communities rallying. People who do fingernails and hair were providing masks and gloves when our government would not. And that is shocking. Wow, that's that's an incredibly shocking detail. And it really drives home, I think it's really illustrative of, of the problems that were going on in long-term care. Um, I'd like to go to Wendy next. Wendy, perhaps you can weigh in on this topic as well, but I'd like to take it to one of our audience questions and perhaps you can weigh in on this. The first question is, um, is how do we ensure all clinical disciplines have a role for safely and appropriately caring for those in long-term care? So I'll, I'll ask Wendy first, and if anyone else wants to chime in after that about bringing these different disciplines in and ensuring that we do have the appropriate staff. Well, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think if we if we take that step back and we look at how long term care is actually resourced um, to deal with our our population of. Um, seniors, relatively stable health-wise, but dealing with age-related frailty and, of course, dementia. Um, and we look at the training that is provided for the staff and the general IPAC training, the Infection Prevention and Control. Um, we are looking at a, at a stage where we've had this pandemic. We've gone through a lot of dark moments in terms of just not being prepared. Um, basically trying our best. And so now we have the opportunity to once again, assess our needs and present. We know now the deficiencies. We know now the clinical expertise that is needed. It is not a shared resource we need. We need the on-site specialist um, that will actually see us through. Uh, so, so in terms of those clinicians necessary um, we do need to look at, yes, the training programs, but also being able to fund 
the the site specific position so that we will be ready and then the staff can be adequately trained and supported through these types of, of pandemic. And what has been the before I move on to Katie with a different question, what has been the response from government on this Donna we saw a, a letter released by long term care association and other stakeholders about warnings that have been issued to the government in preparing for a second wave and getting those specialists in so can you speak to how the warnings for the second wave of COVID have been received. Yeah, absolutely. So we started sounding the alarm back in spring. So as we were coming out of wave one, we knew what the gaps were. And we knew that staffing was one of the biggest challenges that we were going to have. Our staff were traumatized. And we knew that if we were going to get more staff in or staff back, we needed them to be safe. Uh, and we needed to put supports around them. Because quite honestly, the the mental health and well-being of, of, our, of our staff teams is, is tragic. And these are people who were tasked with putting their residents in, in when they when they were deceased in body bags because nobody would come in. So we, you know that's the that's the nature of what these people were dealing with. These and they they are my heroes. And so you know we determined uh, to Wendy's point we needed infection prevention control expertise in the home. We need doctors to come on site. In many cases, doctors didn't come in the homes at all, and and there are reasons for that. Um, but. So, so those are key pieces for us that, that we feel are really important as well as prioritizing testing. We put out an action plan, uh, sent, sent it to the Premier and our ministers uh, at the beginning of June. All summer we kept talking about the action plan. We, we could see what was coming and I'd love to hear Katie's perspective because you know we can see what's happening around the world and what's coming our way. And unfortunately, you know, things sort of went on hold uh, once we got through July and there was a lot of reflection in government at a time when we actually needed action and response. You know, we, we knew what we needed to do that, that you know, a month of, of introspection and reflection in our minds uh, was was wasted time. And, and I think we're certainly seeing the outbreaks in Ottawa now. How is it that a home gets to the point where it takes a month and 11 deaths of seniors and untold counts of positive tests for staff before help is provided. That's unconscionable. Yeah. Katie, I would like to come to you next. We've we've heard and talked a lot about the situation in Ontario. Perhaps you can shed some light about what was going on in the United States and whether that should have been seen as a warning as to what was coming here or maybe how things were handled differently in that country. Well, um, as you know, you know, the U.S. has been hit really hard uh, by COVID uh, and it continues to plague us. 41% um, of the deaths in our country have, have been in long-term care. Um, so that's uh, shameful and it also could have been avoided. We knew, the first, we knew when, this, when COVID hit our shores that those who were most at risk were those who were older and with underlying health conditions, exactly the population uh, that lives in a nursing home. So as a country, we could have been much better prepared. We could have targeted resources, which we didn't do. There's so many parallels to what you all have described in uh, in Canada. You know, long-term care in the US is underfunded. It's underappreciated. And I think what we've really learned through COVID is it's really not well understood uh, who, lives in who lives in nursing homes, for example, what their health conditions are, who works in nursing homes, uh, the kinds of wonderful people that work in nursing homes. And I think one of the things um, that's become very clear is, you know, nursing homes have staff, there are three shifts a day. So there's staffs who are coming and going. And if there was an outbreak in a nursing home, it was because there was an outbreak in the broader community. It was that community spread that brought it into the nursing home because staff are going home at night. They may be unwittingly exposing themselves in some way to the virus and bringing it back in, not on purpose, but because we weren't doing adequate testing at the time. Frankly, we still aren't. Um, so we have we have learned a lot. Um, we have, I don't think we've um, necessarily taken all the actions that we should have uh, based on the learnings to date. Um, and, you know, we're preparing for this to be with us for time for a long time to come. Um, if I could jump in for for a minute, yes, um, it's also important to understand that long-term care homes 
are, are normally ready for two to three outbreaks a year. So in our normal routines, we're ready for an outbreak that'll last between two to three weeks at any given time. We're faced with a pandemic that has stretched over months. So we've got the initial feeling of that partnership and cooperation and everyone's on side to help us lock down and secure things. And then as the, the pandemic prolongs, we get into that feeling of fatigue, trust is being strained, the disruption continues. And finally, now we're at this reopening stage and are we prepared for wave two? And we're frankly feeling abandoned, right? We're, we're feeling that our staff are burnt out, the residents can no longer tolerate this isolation. Yes, we know the families that that direct contact is essential, um, but we can't control without the staff to be able to monitor things, without the additional money to be able to provide the PPE, the supplies necessary. It is really difficult for us to, to manage now as we look at phase two or wave two upon us. So it is that feeling of we're, we're frustrated, but we also feel defenseless as we keep being asked, are you ready? No, we are not ready. I'd like to, to, um, to come to an audience question on the topic of staffing and perhaps Laura can weigh in and then others. Um, so the question is in regards to staffing short and long-term, how can temporary and emergency staffing firms best support the sector? Well, that question, I'll, I'll leave some of the details to Donna because we've had lots of conversations very specifically about that. Let me take a piece of that in terms of the staffing and the staffing shortage. So there's a couple of pieces that I want to address. You know, one of the big stories that we've been hearing is the profound isolation and loneliness of people who are in long-term care and the huge negative impact it is on family caregivers. And I know that many of us here are caregivers and we have our own lived experience and you can just imagine how terrible it is when we're having, you know, emails and phone calls and, and our own experiences saying, you know, I haven't talked to my partner, my husband, my spouse, my daughter, my son. And you're hearing that from residents. And and those are few and far between because mostly they don't have access to tell you their stories. By contrast, we had a flood of family caregivers. I use family in the broadest possible terms of supporters and, and people who are unpaid caregivers. And it's important to remember is because we are so short staffed in long-term care, that those essential family caregivers are actually providing care provision, right? They are not just showing up for a cup of tea, which is very nice to do. We're not talking about your niece that pops by for a family visit every two months. We're talking about people for whom twice a day visits include helping with toileting, bathing, and actually social interaction. And when you have predominantly people with cognitive impairment, Ontario, about 90% of people in long-term care home of cognitive impairment, and you don't have the queuing of seeing people, interacting with people, we saw huge, huge deterioration in the population's well-being. Even if they didn't have COVID-19, they lost the ability to move. They lost the ability to speak clearly in some cases. They lost the ability to toilet. And so it wasn't just that they were sad or lonely, but actually they lost incredible function. And the family caregivers were saying, you know, we hear that there's massive shortages and temp agencies are part of that conversation and staff is part of that conversation. But I know my loved one better than anybody else. I have been providing like technical health care for years. I know their condition better. Let me in. I'll follow whatever infection prevention control. No problem. I'll take training. I will wear PPE. I'll buy my own PPE in some cases if they could afford it. And many can't. And yet those were blocked. And so one of those lessons learned is how imp how critically important to the actual care provision, not just mental and social well-being, but actually hands-on bodies, healthcare, essential family caregivers is. And maybe I'll turn to Donna to talk because we've had a lot of conversations about the role of temporary workers and, and how uh, agencies play an important role, particularly because we have to think about workers as coming from the health and housing continuum. So for pulling people, they're pulling them from somewhere. They're coming from home care or they're coming from acute care or they're coming from agencies. And, you know, long-term care almost have to 
to find money for that. And so that's part of the story. So maybe I'll welcome Donna to speak to some of those specifics. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Laura. And, you know, certainly before COVID-19, we had homes across the province who were almost exclusively reliant on agency staff in order to fill their fill their roles in their homes. Uh, and what we certainly experienced uh, when we went uh, into uh, the pandemic response plan and moving to a single site for, for our staff, uh, again, agency staff became pivotally important. I, I think where the challenge is, um, it's a Band-Aid. Uh, we, need, we need to build uh, and be creative on how we build a new workforce within our homes uh, that is dedicated, you know, having, having full-time staff and staff dedicated to the home creates a, new, a different culture. Uh, and, but certainly agency staff have flexibility in being able to work at multiple sites under, under the current orders. So, um, we can tap into that as a resource, but it, it's not a long-term solution, uh, but it also creates some other challenges for us uh, insofar as financially and, and you know, your business audience, uh, long-term care homes uh, were provided emergency containment funding from the pro provincial government. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, across the entire sector, they spent double what was given to them. So it doesn't matter about ownership. Everybody was trying to do whatever it takes. And so severe short uh, cash shortfalls, uh, certainly cash flow issues. Uh, when when agency staff costs almost double what, what you would pay your, your own staff, uh, that becomes prohibitively expensive. And then you have to start making choices. So we have to pay the bills. We had to pay for personal protective equipment up front. Uh, we had to, um, so it was cash before delivery. Uh, agencies, uh, you know, we, we need to see them as good partners, but I think the agency staff also have, the agency operators also have to appreciate the financial um, fragility of our sector is, as Wendy noted uh, and Laura noted, uh, really underfunded uh, and quite brittle. And our number one cost is staff. Uh, so you have a choice, but, it, but if you have no money, especially small charitable homes, uh, it's, it's, it's a devastating cost. And so, you know, in many cases, they've, they've not filled beds because they can't staff the beds because they don't have the, the funding resources. Uh, it, you know, and that's, that's part of the tra tragedy. But agency staff have to be partners with us and but I, I think we all need to recognize the economic reality of what we're working working through right now and so what's it going to take for the staffing crisis crisis to be solved i mean obviously this is the big question heading into the fall and it's been a big question in the sector for months and years and i, I don't expect a nice tidy answer but is it is it um paying people more to work in the sector, better benefits and flexibility, or as you say, Donna, is it a question of funding to keep the sector going over the long term? What are what is what is long term care asking for in order to make this work, to have enough people in homes to give people basic dignities in life? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start and pass it off to the others, but it's not just about money. If it had been about money, pandemic pay would have brought people back. It's about safety. It's about ensuring the health and well-being of, of the staff as well as the residents. If we are going to have people to care for our residents, we need to make sure that our staff feel protected. And that's ensuring the medical presence, ensuring that they're getting tested, that they have access to the personal pr protective equipment, uh, that we've got robust partnerships with hospitals where when you ask for help, help will come. Uh, not uh, to, to Wendy's point, uh, waiting, uh, you know, waiting for the, the long term care home to fail and for people to die before people come in. I, I think, uh, you know, staff, existing staff and returning staff and new staff need to know that they will be safe and they will be supported and that we will be working together and wrapping our arms around each other as we shore up our residents. Um, it, this is about people. Uh, it's not about money. And I would say it's about ageism as much as it's about any other thing. It's important to remember that those who work in the field of aging, whether that be geriatricians, whether that be nurses, social workers, personal support workers across the board, get paid less money to work with older people than they do for younger people. It just sounds astonishing. And in addition to that, there's a cool factor. You get paid more money if you work in acute care and we pay you less money the farther away that you are from a hospital. So the same worker has a choice. I can get paid more money, have more benefits, have a safer work experience, 
because of all of the supports and the integrated care and acute care, or I could work in home care or I could work in long-term care. So not only is it less, um, less cool because people don't want to work with older people, uh, but it is every bit as, as challenging to understand how we do this. And I think fundamentally when we're making our recommendations, and I invite you to look at our website under canage.ca slash voices, we created a roadmap for Canada for change. We have a very, very specific recipe for long-term care and staffing is a big part of it. We need health and human resources as a strategy. That means we need immigration focused on the aged care sector. We have lots of people who want to come and work in Canada who are excellent and trained and we have a shortage of them. Let's open it up to trained people and, and allow immigration to help to support that. Let's make sure that you can have on the job training so that you are not waiting at home to finish now what is essential Actually online modules when you could be working on an integrated basis in long-term care home, perhaps in an area of like leisure and support and build your credentials for personal support workers. The great thing about this is that we actually know exactly how to do it. It really is a hopeful story. But in the end, why do I think we're so short-staffed is because there is always money and support for things that people want and care about. And fundamentally, we do not care about older people. We need to change that. I would totally agree with what you're saying. And I think, you know, we're having, this is a very robust conversation we're having in the U.S. right now. And it really comes down to all the things Donna described, but at the end of the day, you invest in what you value. And we, the long-term care has been undervalued. The people who work in long-term care, those jobs are undervalued. We haven't created good career paths. We don't appreciate what, what they do. And therefore, um, why would people want to work in long-term care? So we have this, this is a challenge in the U.S. It's a challenge all over the world, frankly, this staffing issue. It's a definitely a challenge throughout Europe. Um, immigration is certainly a solution, but it's not the only solution. We need to start with sort of the fundamentals of let's value these jobs and pay them well, treat them well, give them benefits, provide career paths. So it's meaning because it is meaningful work. And I think also if we take a look at some lessons learned just during these last few months, where most homes lost between 20 to 30% of their staff as a result of whether it was having to, to use the single, um, select the single employer, or there were childcare issues, or you had um, in, uh, compromised immune systems. For whatever reason, we lost just a chunk of staff with, with, what, with what felt like overnight. Okay, and, and so we had to hire a completely new um, category of staffing, the resident support assistants, um, the screeners, and we now have months of hands-on experience with these staff. And again, here's an opportunity for us to groom them to become more integrated in our day-to-day -day care system. So yes, we've got the PSWs, we've got the, the nursing staff with the RNs and the RPNs, but here is a whole complement of staff that have really helped over this period of the pandemic. And we need that flexibility that we have had during the pandemic to continue because we have seen a real benefit in having them. So again, you need to see that flexibility play out so we can use the lessons learned. And, and if we've got a complement of staff now ready to go, why don't we just use them and continue their training to the level that we will require going forward? It, to me, it's, it's a low-hanging fruit for us. What, just to clarify, Wendy, what do you mean by flexibility and why, why aren't these people being utilized if they have the experience now to, to work in long-term care? Okay, so we are functioning under emergency orders which allows us to secure staffing outside of our bargaining units. So these categories, um, the screeners and the resident assistants, they're not unionized employees. So as soon as that order gets lifted and we have to then determine, okay, can we continue the, these um, staffing complements? Do we now have to go through the whole union battle right to get this this new category of staff in the bargaining unit um they're not comparable to psws they don't get paid the rate of the psw so there are some steps that still need to take place but again government does have the the power to be able to to allow us that flexibility to be able to have that that 
category of staff stay on board. Um, so again, that that's flexibility that we need. And I just want to jump in here talking about the fact that there's a there's an inverted triangle from what we used to have. This is evolution. So, you know, one of the issues that we like to vilify is this question of public and private. Maybe we'll get to that as well. But I just wanted to share with you that when we designed the Canada Health Act in 1987, the average age of death was 76 years. And we just didn't have people living as long or as frail or with the degree of care needs and, and the degree of dementia that we have now. I, I don't believe that we thought it through and made the decision not to cover it. I just don't think that it was really part of the conversation at that point. But what's important to know is, you know, back then, it looked like this. You would have lots of robust sort of doctors and, and trained nurses, RNs, physiatrists, people who are doing activation therapy, because mostly you were getting care at home or maybe in some extended care kind of extended hospital type of services that we would see in the 80s, right? As we closed those types of things down and then really built up this long-term care sector, which is fine, we inverted that triangle. People seem to think that there are doctors roaming the halls of long-term care. They are like chicken's teeth. If you can find a geriatrician in a long-term care home, you know, grab them because they are incredibly rare. We have some doctors who refuse to go into long-term care, but are somehow in charge of hundreds and hundreds of residents residents. We have in Ontario requirement of like one RN on time on the floor and you could have hundreds of people. And so we have consistently downgraded the, the kind of mix of people who are providing care services. And now we've downgraded it almost entirely to PSWs. And, and now we're looking at leisure support workers. What we would offer and kind of what we at CanAge are saying is there needs to be a mix. And we are we are calling for both staffing ratios because we've gone a long time talking about hours and this and that in the end, we don't get it. So we're actually calling for staffing ratios, but not just numbers of sort of PSWs. They're, they're not physiatrists. They're not rehabilitation therapists. They are not geriatricians. They are um, heroes who are working incredibly hard to support people, but we need that integrated mix. And right now we do not have it. I'd like to go to another audience question and perhaps Katie, you can weigh in first. It's a really interesting one. It's, it's asking if the concept of large institutions for housing of seniors is an appropriate design for the future. And maybe you could talk a bit about alternative uh, methods, home care, are we able to keep seniors at home with, with people coming in? What do you think of this, of, of this question about whether we need to rethink large institutions for seniors care? Well, I have a couple of answers to that. One is that um, one of the things that we've learned so far in uh, COVID is that the smaller homes, greenhouses, neighborhoods, small homes have done much better job at keeping COVID out. Part of that is people have their own private rooms. We don't have three or four people to a room. Some of it is the staffing model that goes with it. And some of it is just that it's a, it's a smaller place and an easier to manage. Um, easier to isolate somebody who does get COVID, for example. Um, so I think there is a good conversation for us to have about the physical design of long-term care homes um, going forward in, in terms of both quality of life as well as infection control and other things. Um, you know, in the U.S., we look at our long-term care system a little bit differently than you do in Canada, which is long-term care includes home care. It includes home health. It includes adult day. It includes assisted living. It's not just nursing homes. It includes uh, hospice care, for example. Um, and there is a major push in the U.S. to push more and more, more, and more services into the home and home health. And, you know, we have at leading age, we have a lot of members who provide home health and you can do a lot in somebody's home. Um, you can provide ventilator care in an individual's home with the right, uh, with the right staffing around it. Uh, so I think we're gonna see more and more of that, particularly as older adults fear moving into long-term care. We're gonna have to figure out how to make this a system as opposed to a lot of silos and a system that actually works together and then, of course, the staffing issue, which we've talked about at great length, is true in home care as well. It's true in home health. Um, so at the beginning of COVID, for example, our members who provide home health care 
they had a huge number of cases and very few visits because people just didn't want anybody to come into their home. Now they just can't, they can't manage the volume that they're, uh, the, uh, the demand for home visits that they're seeing now because they don't have enough staff. So again, it's, it's like balls in a bowl. You know, you've got, it's a lot of pieces and they all need to work together, but you move one and everything else moves. But it's really all part of how do we care for older adults as safely and as with as highest quality as we possibly can in wherever they call home. I'd like to keep going with the audience questions because they're really good, thoughtful questions. Um, the next one is how should long-term care balance medical and social care? And, and they ask if there's a risk that long-term care is simply becoming medical institutions as a result of the pandemic. Would anyone like to chime in on that? Why don't you start, Laura? Uh, you know, in our um, Voices of Canada's Seniors, a roadmap to an age inclusive Canada, we break out under the level C, you know, our, our really important requirements. People ask me if I was going to change one thing in long term care, what would you change? And I say it's the model because everything else flows down from the model. So, Laura, you asked, you know, our large giant housing institutions where we should go? No, 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 absolutely not. We need to move to small villages, a Nordic model, 10 to 25 people in pods. Infection prevention and control is much better. We know that people have a much better outcome if they have dementia. We know that workers are safer, that people uh, have fewer behavioral responses. It's all, We have all of the evidence that we need that this is the way to go. Having said that, we have lots of people with nowhere to go. So you can't magically make those overnight. You have to actually build them and then support the transition for it, right? So it's, it requires planning. We are very concerned about the return of the medical model. We've been fighting against it. And so when we did our roadmap, we specifically put long-term care under our sea of caregiving, that health and housing continuum that you were talking about, Katie, as opposed to our O, which is optimal health and well-being, because it's a person's home. And and when I see the Long-Term Care Commission announced in Ontario, one of the concerns I had, not that the people who were appointed weren't very smart and I'm sure bring a lot of value to the table. But one of the three commissioners is a hospitalist. And those of us in the sector kind of did this a little bit because the idea is not for hospitals to run long-term care, quite the contrary. It's about putting people in community. It's about breaking walls down. And when I say that, you know, how substantive is it that we have these walls? As a lawyer and talking to my other lawyer friends, I can find nowhere in Canadian law, let alone Ontario law, that would allow you to have a detention order for people. Imagine you were detained in your own home against your will. That has been the experience of people in long-term care. And yet somehow, because they had this sort of medicalized version, it was okay to imprison people where there would be riots in the streets if we tried to do that. So we need to, again, transition our understanding. These are people's homes. We need to make them look like homes. We need to make them staff like homes. And we need to fully reject a medical model. I'm worried as we are championing acute care heroes, which by the way, I have all the, the kindness, warmth and support in the world for our acute care system, but they don't wanna house seniors and seniors don't wanna be there. Yeah, I have to agree with Laura. You know, there is a fine balance here. And I think as Katie was so eloquently putting it around, what is that care continuum and what is our definition of long term care? And, you know, we, we gravitate to the definition of it being this institutionalized uh, model of care. And certainly we've got to rethink it. Uh, we know that the population over 80 is, is going to double in the next uh, 13 years. You know, it can't just be about building beds. Uh, and insofar as we're going to build beds, um, remember the beds have people in them and people beside them. We really do do be, need to be mindful about, about who, who we're serving and, and look at that full structured continuum of care. So certainly in Toronto, uh, Sunnybrook Hospital has a, a, a very innovative um, uh, step down program from the hospital with community partners where they transition out of hospital into transition space uh, supported by uh, loft and um, 
and Sprint, which are uh, uh, providers, including for, for seniors care, we have hospitals with hospital uh, transition programs in the, in the old in Humber River Hospital. Those are, those are more medicalized transitional programs, which are longer term care than, than you would have in hospital, but certainly not as long term as you, as you would have in, in our uh, in our homes. Uh, so I think those are those models. And then what, what is that longer term care, which is, you know, essentially today more, more uh, longer term end of life care. Uh, and then what, what is the care that, that can be provided in the home? And what is the care that can be provided in, in the support of housing or assisted living or in retirement? We really do need to have that bigger discussion and and really build it out in a structured way. It, I always say that long term care is sort of built, built like Jenga, but I would argue the healthcare system is where we have one piece piled on top and move things around a bit and, it, and it's precarious and it's going to topple. How do we build a jigsaw puzzle that has a clear and coherent vision, such as when Laura's uh, uh, CAN has articulated in their roadmap. Uh, I, I think that's our opportunity. And, and I would say to echo Laura's earlier words, that that's the hope. Uh, I think that we've shone a light on this, as, as Laura Stone has commented on. We People now know about this. And now that we all know, we have a collective and individual responsibility and accountability to fix this. And we know what we need to do. We've got roadmap, thanks, Laura. Um, but uh, now is the time. We can't squander this opportunity. And, and we can't wait for the pandemic to be over. Whatever measures we're putting in place, and certainly our proposal through the Long-Term Care Association for Wave 2 started is, is about putting foundational pieces in place that will start to build out that jigsaw puzzle under which, you know, and hopefully we, we will actually see the picture emerge that's clear and coherent and locked together. Yeah. Donna, I just want to want to follow up and ask you a question from the audience that I think you could speak well to because your association represents 70% of homes, both private and, um, and public. So uh, they ask, can you comment on the sustainability of the current model of long-term care ownership and management between government and private ownership. Do you foresee a mix still of that working? Do you think there should be one um, one ownership that that takes precedence over another? How is the how is the sector going to re remain sustainable in the current model that exists? You know, certainly we've been crunching the data, and I know that ownership keeps emerging as an issue. Uh, I would argue to one of Laura's earlier points, we're all looking for a villain. And, uh, you know, the villain in this is actually COVID-19 and the virus, but it's invisible. So, you know, certainly, uh, you know, people are looking for data. They're looking to see, okay, what is what is the, the ownership factor here? And I would argue uh, ownership it, based on our data the majority of homes in Ontario are uh, private for profit. Uh, there are chains. Uh, certainly we've been seeing those chains actually stepping up and putting significant investments in, especially over the past months, uh, supporting the small homes. Uh, what, what we're certainly seeing where the precariousness is actually coming into play is in the, the, the small uh, nonprofit homes. So we're seeing municipal homes, the government's announced new hospital uh, developments for long-term care. And then we have the larger operators who, who have retained infection control specialists and epidemiologists and they have doctors on staff uh, who are guide medical directors uh, full-time who are who are doing work and I think you know the the uh, conflation of events uh, the perfect storm in the homes where we had the worst losses really had to do with geography and we're certainly seeing that in Ottawa right now it's a hot spot uh, critical staffing shortages in the old homes with three and four bedrooms. Uh, the government controls the, the capital program and redevelopment program. Uh, they, you know, this government, the, the Ford government actually uh, saw that as a problem and announced as a, a campaign priority that they were going to rebuild it. You know, certainly the, the, uh, the private companies are able to to invest in that and, and afford the properties that nonprofits can't. Uh, and given the cash flow issues, issues around insurance, indemnification, and financing, uh, we're very very concerned that the the larger operators can absorb that, the municipalities can absorb that. But what is the future of a nonprofit long term care home in the province of Ontario? Is the question I would be asking. Yeah, we're hearing the same thing. I mean, it's ironic in some way because there has been this sort of vilification. I think there's there's ways of improving and that kind of 
leads, I think, to some conversations that the throne speech has sparked about national quality standards. Like, what is it that we're trying to actually measure? What is it that we're trying to actually deliver? And then where the mix is. You know, if, again, if we went back to 1987, would we design it like this? I don't think so. But this is where we are. And other countries like Australia have a very analogous mix. And the difference for them is that they do have an arm's length regulator and they do have national quality standards and they work in the federated model as well. So there's a way through this conversation. As I say that the pointy end of the stick is this, the bigger chains have diversified revenue streams right? They also operate retirement homes, which is in Ontario, essentially, but for about five entirely for profit, which is a little bit different than some other jurisdictions. And they have home care and they have other, you know, diversified assets. They're going to make it through. What's not going to make it through are the homes that we're always trying to champion, you know, the smaller not for profit or family small homes that are running a small chain, et cetera. Those are the ones that have been held up and yet without the investment and without the support for insurance, they're the ones that are going to go under. Yep. Wendy, I, I'm curious what role you you think the private sector could or should play in long term care? Well, I, I think first I want to just just look at the distinction as you were talking about the medical versus you know, the model that we want to see is the more home, homely model. Um, we call our seniors residents for a reason. They're not just patients that you patch up, you, you know, you, you do the, the whole curing of the, of the critical issue, the acute care, and then you send them off on their way. No, we're like the fourth leg of the relay. We journey with our residents through to the end, all the way making sure that they finish strong, that that is our responsibility. And where government comes to the table with their funding, right now we're seeing two hours of direct care per resident per day. That's not gonna be enough. Private care, so long-term care, we don't get the funding from the private um, community that maybe a hospital will get, definitely the, the, the children's hospital i mean you've got fundraisers they just need to pick up their phones okay our phones are not ringing off the hook with private investment you know there's no government that wins a platform because they are pushing for seniors care it's just not that hot topic that is the shiny object that everyone wants but yet when touched by a loved one who is now living in long-term care that's the focus so we want private investment. We need private investment, but to make it attractive to them, we need to be able to say, okay, this is a product that will give you a return on investment. We need to have government come alongside and, and partner with us, not say that the safety of our, of our residents is, is our responsibility and not theirs. I mean, if we don't have a product that is shared and, and seen as valuable in the community, we won't attract that private investment. But it, it's not something that we can do alone. One hand can't clap. So it takes that collaboration. It takes mm -hmm. that collaboration to be able to attract the private investors. But I think there's a role to play. And that's an interesting point for Wendy because Wendy's coming at it from the angle of somebody who runs a nonprofit who is reliant on donations and corporate donations and is competing with hospitals for those donations, especially in this time when, when with the economic situation that's tough. So you've got the, the role for the private sector in different ways. I know even earlier somebody mentioned uh, that we had the question around agency staff. That's, the, that's a private sector role. Certainly we're seeing private sector labs involved in the system. We've certainly seen, um, you know, the private pharmacies now uh, coming in to support with the testing as well. So, you know, as we think about private care and the role of the private sector, I think we have to look beyond the, uh, the large chain companies uh, and think more broadly about, again, what does the system look like? What is the model care? What are the accountabilities? And how do we ensure that we're building an accountability and that we all have a shared responsibility in making sure that whatever we're building and delivering is around the people we're serving and, and that supports the people who, who are 
sitting beside them uh, and caring for them. Uh, we, we can't lose the human element in this. Uh, I would say, and certainly these days, I'm saying I don't care about ownership. What I care about is the person who's in the bed, uh, who's vulnerable and could potentially die. Uh, you know, we need to ask for help regardless of ownership. When a home asks for help, it means they need help. And we should not wait and say, you're a private sector operator, you fix it, you, 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 you pay dividends in May. So it, we can't lose sight of the human beings in this. This is about humanity. This is about individuals and it's, it's about people's lives. And, and I think uh, one of the things that people really misunderstand because it's incredibly confusing is when we're saying private and public, we're not talking about retirement homes, right? So people will say, my mom's in long-term care, but they're actually in a retirement home. And because our long-term care sector has been starved of investment in assets, governments over governments over governments have allowed this completely private pay, again, with the exception of, I think, five in, in Ontario, completely private pay alternative, who are allowed to deliver almost exactly the same types of care that you would get as part of your OHIP, plus your additional supplements that you pay. And so people would say, oh, well, my mom's in a private home. And I say, well, are they kind of a, a long-term care home, which is part of the Long-Term Care Homes Act and is part of our healthcare system? Oh, and the only real difference is that they're paying dividends to shareholders as opposed to a not-for-profit who does not pay dividends, who invest it back in. Or are you talking about $12,000 a month for private dementia care pursuant to a retirement home? So we actually often are mixing apples and oranges. The bigger question is, why have we as a province downloaded our responsibility to provide aged care as part of our public sector into entirely private pay retirement homes? That's the question we need to answer. And why are they regulated? very lightly when long-term care homes are regulated second only to the nuclear system in Ontario. The system needs to fix. I'd like to ask Katie um, uh, something that you were talking about, Laura, and perhaps you can talk about it in the context of the U.S. as well, but it's a question we received from the audience regarding standards for long-term care. We heard the Prime Minister talk about this in the throne speech yesterday. Um, do you think that stronger regulations or stronger standards for long-term care would help um, alleviate some of the problems that we've seen? Or do these already exist and they're just not being followed in some cases? I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts. Well, in the US, our system of regulating nursing homes um, is now 33 years old without any fundamental changes. And to a point that Donna made earlier, the people who live in nursing homes are different from those 33 years ago. The way care, the care practices in nursing homes are completely different. So we need a complete overhaul of our regulatory system. And I don't think it's a question of strong standards or weak standards. I think it's the right standards, standards that really foster quality and quali quality improvement and that don't focus on punishment. And I think that we have a lot to do. I think this is a place where the world can come together. Many countries can come together and really think about this because we're all struggling with the same thing. Um, so I look forward to having those conversations with my colleagues around the world. I'd like to just end on perhaps going to each of the panelists and Maybe you can say one thing that you're hoping can happen this fall or that can change in long-term care as we wrap up our discussion and can end on hopefully a more positive note uh, about where we're heading in the fall. What is one thing that you would like to see done in the immediate that can help improve long-term care, that can help potentially save some lives, that can make a difference and that you would like to see happen right away? And I'll just start with you, Donna. Um, uh, it, in my dream, uh, we all mobilize around long-term care, that we step up, we do what it takes, we come together, we stop blaming. Uh, this is our moment. Uh, you know, this is a moment it, that we rarely get where all of us can embrace our seniors, uh, work together, come together, and uh, have collective impact in, in making sure that we start on a path to making things better. This is and keeping them safe. Laura? Federal funding tied to outcomes and national quality standards with an arm's length regular. We know how to do it. It was announced in the throne speech, the early bits of that. 
we'll see if the money flows. The provinces can't do it alone at this point, and we know that, particularly in COVID-19. Wendy? I think, again, um, to, to mirror a bit of what Donna said, we do want to see that collaboration and cooperation with government, with families, residents, our staff, um, because it's a team. And so we, we can have the, the visits that the, the families want to do, that the residents need, if we've got the staffing. We can address the infection prevention and control requirements if we've got the expertise. So these are not things that are impossible for us, but we do need the support. And, and that's what we need. We need government to say not only send another survey and we'll collect the data, but we want that action now. And that's what long-term care needs, not another Band-Aid. We need a real investment that will support real transformation for the future. And Katie? Um, that we don't just try to patch together the fractures in our long-term care system, but we really take advantage of this moment to try to rebuild based on everything that we know to date about what makes a good high quality long-term care system. Thank you all much for your thoughts today. It was a great discussion. Uh, I hope our audience enjoyed it as well. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to wrap it up or if we're going back to Colleen, but- Hi, Thank you. I I'll appreciate you. it so much. Thank you all so much. The time went so quickly. Um, thank you for engaging with us online today, everyone. Panel, thank you for your incredible passion and insights. I believe that the lives of our oldest citizens will be greatly benefited by your incredible and crucial work. I hope that the right people have been listening today. And thank you, Laura, for um, fielding all the questions. It was really um, uh, great to have you here at the podium. And I want to thank again, Torque and Mains for their generous support in sponsoring this event today. And we have some upcoming events that you might want to join us uh, next Wednesday on the 30th. We are partnering with the Institute for Sustainable Finance for a panel on financing Canada's climate smart economy. And then the next day on October 1st, we have G Gillian Riley from Tangerine Bank and Sabrina Jeremiah of Google Canada for a discussion on setting women entrepreneurs up for success. So Thank you to our AV supplier, Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeeting.ca for making it possible for us to come together. Thank you again to our panel. Guests, thank you for joining us. Please stay healthy and be safe.